despite naming a starting quarterback going into the season, I, I don't think this quarterback battle is settled after defeating Mercer. Well, Zach, I, I actually just finished crushing some chicken farm, and I am freaking ready to rock and roll. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby. Thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. The Auburn Tigers defeat the Mercer Bears 42-16. to And joining me to break it down on this Sunday is Daryl Daprich. Uh, Montgomery radio vet. And look, uh, I think the biggest story, Daryl, is the quarterback. TJ Finley trotted out there. Uh, the fourth play of the game, uh, Robbie Ashford goes in there and they just kind of had this rotating thing where it's like, okay, TJ's the guy. And then Robbie was kind of this piece. And then TJ Finley throws two picks and all of a sudden it got really, really interesting. It really did. I mean, it looked like there was a strategy, obviously, or, you know, early on. There was a, a definite game plan where T.J. Finley was going to be the guy throwing the football from the pocket, and Robbie Ashford was going to make plays with his legs, with design runs, and it was really effective. I mean, it, Auburn scored, you know, a lot early on, and, and it was a good balance of running. You didn't know if Ashford was going to keep it or hand it to Bigsby or or Jarquez, and then Finley right. was making some good throws. So the, the game plan to use two guys and was was working well, and then it happened. Yeah, yeah, and really everything outside of the two picks for Finley, I actually really liked. I mean, some of the throws were, 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 were money. They were quick. He got it out of his hands fast. And so I think there's a lot of things that TJ did well, but – you just can't do that. Like, I, I don't know how you could leave this game and go into, you know, preparation for next week and be like, okay, we trust him for a full 60 minutes to lead the offense. I just don't know if you could do that right now. No, I think there was a difference. It was very telling to me that once Finley came out, he never got another snap. He never got another possession. If you remember last year against LSU, after T.J. Finley came in against Georgia State, there was some talk. Who's going to start? Who's going to start the Georgia State game? I mean, who's going to start the LSU game? Bo started. Then T.J. got a couple possessions. But then Bo Nix came back in the game. T.J. Finley never got back in the game. And body language on the sideline looked to me like he knew he wasn't. And that was Robbie Ashford's game the rest of the way to see. To me, it felt like an audition is what I kind of took from it. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what I felt like we were all watching. Is like, can Robbie win the QB one job? I don't know if he did it, Daryl, but it definitely did feel like he was kind of being given an opportunity where it's like, okay, go do what you need to do. It's just from a passing standpoint, like he brings a spark. There's no question about it. But even with TJ's two picks, like uh, Robbie went four of seven for a hundred yards. And I mean, the bulk of that was that one pass to Javaris Johnson, which was wonderful, which was absolutely wonderful. Then he tried to do it again and he underthrew it. it we were able to draw a, a, a pass interference call on it, which I think was extremely questionable. But hey, I will take that every single time. But yeah, I, I just, I, I don't know how you make this decision because I don't think they trust Robbie to pass it consistently. And I just don't think they trust TJ to make good decisions consistently over the course of, you know, running 70 plays in a day. It, it's tough. I don't know who to pick. Yeah, it's interesting, though. There's a couple of things to look at from a positive standpoint that might help with this. Number one, what would Robbie Ashford's stats be projected over full four full quarters? Good he question. really didn't get to start throwing the ball until late in the second quarter, even though he was in the game in the first quarter. They weren't letting him throw it at all until either late in the first half or when they came back out in the second half. That's number one. Number two – you have a game against San Jose State who might be worse than Mercer with what they did, and we'll get to that later. Sure. And you've got all the practices leading up to San Jose State and then after San Jose State, San Jose State to make the game plan a little bit different in routes that Robbie Ashford might be comfortable throwing. So you have some time to get this kind of worked out, which I think is good. But again, we don't know what his stats would have looked like if he would have let it rip all four quarters. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, if you multiply his stats by four, you know, are we okay if he goes 16 of 28? Like, are we okay with that? 
I think in some games that that that's good enough with what well, we. Well, if you th- yeah, if he throws for two ten and rushes for seventy, and you know has two hundred ninety yards of of total offense. Yeah, that's I wasn't Nick, really putting in the, the rushing attack. In yeah, that. that's you know think of Nick, think of Nick's Nick Marshall stats right when he was he yeah. might throw it for one hundred and forty and run it for one hundred and forty and that's two hundred eighty yards of total offense. You get that out of your quarterback. I think you take it as long as now if they load up the box and a team says beat us with your arm, then you have to adjust and see if he can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm not convinced that he can, but if you're Brian Harson and you like, you look at this roster, you're like, I really like the rest of it. Uh, the wide receivers, even though they weren't super active in the passing game, with the exception of really Javarius Johnson, and it shed... Who else got four catches? Yeah, Shedrick Jackson also got four yeah, catches. He did, and then and then um, J- uh, Dawson had one that, that that we talked about off air that could have been a big gainer had Ashford yeah. led him. It was his first completed pass, but right. they were open. They ran great routes, and you know what? I didn't see a lot of drops, True. so that was good. When the ball, I mean, Schenker dropped one downfield. To be perfectly honest, that was a nice throw from Finley that he should have had inside the twenty. But other than that, I didn't see any drops. I saw good routes. I saw good catching. And I saw, you know, some some getting extra yards after the catch, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, I, I like TJ stuff with the exception of those two plays. But, I mean, you can't really do that. Like, if you do it once, I think it's okay. But, that, I mean, that second one, that second one was bad. Like, that was, like, uh, that was a bad, bad move for him. I mean, and look, he didn't get to go back into the game. And so I think that's... I think that's pretty telling. So we'll see. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Brian Harson is going to keep this close to the vest. We'll see what happens this Saturday. And if I had to guess right now, Daryl, it'll look very similar. I think TJ trots out, and then I think they rotate Robbie Ashford in, and they do this two quarterback thing for a little bit till somebody really steps up. I think it's going to be interesting. I don't know. I, I I can't get a read either way. I think that I would have said that had Finley gotten back in for a series or two. But again, his body language on the sidelines, and I think it's the the same ball that got intercepted intercepted the first time. It it's similar decision making, right? It wasn't a he he did not read the safety both times and did not see him there, and that's a decision making thing with your eyes downfield that I think Harson really. If it was a, a tip, a deflection. A different type of interception, maybe he goes back in, but it was almost identical. He wasn't reading or seeing the safety. That's dangerous, and in the SEC, it'll get you beat. Yeah, no, there's no question about it, and and it was one of those things where you know he just stared a guy down the whole time, didn't really look and see what the safety was safeties were doing or or anything like that. So that's concerning. That's concerning for sure. Something that was not concerning was this defense for the most part. I do think there were some parts of this that we will ask questions about, but all in all. Um, a lot of things to touch on regarding the defense in just a moment right here on Locked On Auburn. Are you one of those people who think it's okay to drive stoned? What's the worst that can happen? You may ask yourself. You end up driving below the speed limit. It's no big deal, right? No, that, that that's not true. The truth is your reaction times slow down dramatically when you're high. And when you do this, you don't even put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high and get a DUI. Zach Blackerby and Daryl Daprich here with you on Locked on Auburn. Was really, really impressed with the defense, even when a lot of the starters were out and the two deep was in there. I, I just, I really like a lot of what this defense has to offer. A ton of athleticism in all three levels. Zion Puckett is everywhere. Jalen Simpson's on the field, but nobody wants to talk about him because he just totally erases the guy that he's covering. I mean, there, there's a lot, a lot to like about what uh, what the defense did on Saturday night. There really is. I know it's just one game, but I'm starting to see why the coaches were so high on Keontae Scott, too. Yeah. I mean, he's a he's a cover corner, Zach. He turns his head. He, he closes. He, he covers ground. He closes the gap. I'll say the only thing that I was a little bit concerned and, and about. And, yeah. and he translated it to the middle of the field. Yes. And he tackles in space, right? I mean, he tackles in space. He he does a lot of things that's next level cornerback play that Auburn's had some in, in the traditions of the Carlton Davises and, and some of those guys that, that can really, Carlos Rogers, that can cover you, 
but hits you too in the open field. And I and I really liked what he did. The only, Cam Riley. I mean, I just I, I, early on I kept saying, man, this guy's all over the place. And then finally ended up with like 15 tackles. And other people, including the announcers, were chiming in. My only concern, and I don't want to overreact. It's one game. I, I don't. I look at the stats that I have, and they don't even give Auburn a credit for a sack. And I would have thought that they would have been able. I know they had pressure. They did have pressure on Peyton on the quarterback. But I would have liked to have seen a couple of sacks with that from that defensive line, especially when we were watching the Moorhead State game and Moorhead State's defensive front gave them fits. And yeah. so um, I think a lot of people, Auburn folks, were kind of licking their chops of seeing, okay, what can Eku and Colby and and Derek do? And, and look, I think Eku Leota of those three probably had the best game. I think Eku Leota, his first step isn't always the best. Sometimes Derek Hall beats him off the line. But what Eku does from like a pad level standpoint and from just uh, you know maneuvering his body and his bend, I mean, it's awesome. Like he's not as explosive as Derek Hall, but it just everything that happens like after that that initial step, I think he's incredible at. And he's going to be a problem for some teams that don't have a tackle. Uh, it, it's going to be a big deal for some folks. I agree 100%. And I like the compliment he is to Derek Hall. Yeah. I like the way they compliment each other. Um, he looks different. His body looks leaner. He looks, he just looked different when I, if they first showed 55, you know, on the field, I looked, I'm like, wow, he looks different. And we saw him in person up close at practice. I like the way Jason Jones played and really clogged up the middle. Uh, Marcus Harris played well. It got that the play that he made where he got off the tackle and, and tackled the running back and would have been a first down that fought through the block. He played really good. Of course, Riley played good like we talked about. So, yeah, I was impressed with the defense. I thought that Rim didn't get his head turned around on the, that ball that on third and 20 they got inside the five-yard line. Freshman yeah. mistake. He's a freshman. But, you know, it, it, it is what it is, right? I mean, he's a freshman. So, you know, in, in a normal game situation, I don't know, maybe he's not in there or not, but I like Kaufman on the blitz. I, there's a lot of great things that I saw that I liked from the defense. Yeah, and everybody stepped, you know, they kept talking about, Kaufman's versatility and it's like what does that look like does that just mean he's playing safety and and nickel but no they they sent him on a blitz too on the inside they didn't have him on the edge they stunned him in which I thought was a lot of fun and so they um and, and he almost got the sack which was awesome which is cool I think they put a lot of things offensively and defensively in the play calling in the schematics for other coaches to look look at on tape I like that. There's a lot to look at. And if you're an offensive or defensive coordinator that's going to play Auburn, they put a lot of things on tape for you to worry about. Jumping back offensively, when they put Robbie Ashford at a wide receiver, and then he came around on the jet sweep and then pitched the ball on an option to Hunter. I mean, that's a that's a neat little gadget play that people say, well, why do you show it now? Well, I mean, if Robbie Ashford's in the game at receiver, the defense will think about it. And he may just – tuck it and run next time and not pitch it. So I don't know that he may not be in that situation because he may be the one taking the snap yeah, he, he may directly. Be right. But I just liked I liked the versatility defensively and offensively that they showed some different wrinkles for the other coordinators to, to have to think about. Yeah. The defense to me felt a lot better. I don't care that they gave up 16 points to Mercer. Like I, I'm just not worried about that. They passed the eye test for me. And there's a few guys like I can't wait to see what their uh, what their rating is, what PFF gives them when that comes out, either you know Sunday or Monday. But like, I think Jalen Simpson's rating is going to be really, really good. I think Marcus Harris and Jason Jones's rating is going to be really, really good. And um, I, I think Keontae Scott's rating is going to be really, really, really good. And Nehemiah Pritchett's probably too, just because he was picked on so much. It almost seemed like it was in their game plan to go after him. It almost felt that way. Um, but I don't know. It's impossible to know. But I, I thought that was, I thought all that was interesting. I'm with you though. On, I'm not going to say I'm concerned about the pass rush, but I did think it would be a little bit more dominant than it was. Yeah, and and you know maybe uh, they go, they get it, they look at film and they see some things they can do differently with some stunning and some other things that that might allow. Uh, Leota and Hall to come off the edge a little bit or even get some rush from the inside, right? Sure. Uh, th you know, we, we didn't see multiple blitz packages. We talked about Kaufman coming, but we don't know how much they did hold back from, from blitzes and that type of thing. Maybe they bring that against Penn State 
They just try to play a little bit straight up against San Jose State and try to get pressure from the down line. And we'll see. They've got a lot in their back pocket that they could still reveal. Um, but you mentioned something that I agree, the eye test. The athleticism, sideline to sideline. There were a couple times where I felt like a Mercer back was going to get six, seven, eight yards, and he got three. And they closed it. And I, I thought, wow, that's that's pretty you – know, you know, we're used to SEC defenses being quick. And people talk about it all the time. You're not going to run side to side on an SEC defense. But Auburn got sideline to sideline really quick and I think did a good job of closing gaps, both in the secondary and run games that went along the line of scrimmage. So we'll see how that translates next week and then when it becomes apparent that they play a Big Ten opponent. Right. No, I, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. And, and like, you know, once again, small sample size, pretty much everybody's played a game now at this point. And like looking at Penn State's numbers, like their passing attack was significantly worse when they weren't being blitzed because Purdue was just able to send four. And so that was kind of something I was looking at for Auburn. It's like, all right, in two weeks when Penn State comes into town, is Auburn going to be in a situation where they can just send four and drop seven? And make Sean Clifford beat you like that. That's going to be ideal. I think that's how you beat Penn State in two weeks if you're the Auburn Tigers. Yeah, because Clifford doesn't do any read option either. He's pretty much straight drop back, isn't he? I mean, he yeah. might be able to extend plays with his legs, but he's not. That Peyton guy was doing stuff off the read option. Clifford's just going to drop back, and I think that plays really, really well into Auburn's strengths. I'm there with you. I'm there with you. So I feel really good about that matchup after watching. Penn State on, what was that, Thursday night when they played? Yeah, yeah. Purdue. Yep, yeah, Thursday night. Was, um, they looked terrible in that game. And, and Clifford was good in the last six minutes of it, but all in all, like I, I feel a lot better about that matchup now. And where's the run game with Penn State? I still don't see a good run game, right? I mean, I, I guess if you're it's one the same place where, where it was last year. I mean, You can't be one-dimensional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you come into Jordan-Hare one-dimensional 2.30 in the afternoon that Saturday, it's going to be difficult. Right. Yep. There's no question about it. All right, what does Auburn do? moving forward after we've got this information against Mercer. We'll give you our thoughts in just a moment right here on Locked on Auburn. I want to encourage you to check out the Locked on Auburn Discord. All you have to do is click the link in the episode description down below. If you're listening on audio, it's in your show description. And then also check out all of our written content at auburndaily.com. Daryl, as far as going forward, I, I guess it's still all about the quarterback battle, unfortunately, right? It is, but Auburn's caught a break with that. I mean, it is about the quarterback battle, but imagine if you were opening up like Auburn used to do. I mean, remember the second game of the year sometimes was the SEC opener, right? Auburn's got the luxury yeah. of playing a San Jose State team that barely beat Portland State and looked abysmal doing it. And so, you know, Auburn can – if you're trying to figure out a quarterback hierarchy, you don't have to – you're not going into conference play. You're not playing Penn State next week. You have a whole nother week, a whole nother game, and then another week of practice after that. So Auburn catches a break with that. I really believe they do. And I think defensively also, there are some things you can work on against San Jose State and tinker with. Get it, get in the lab and tinker a little bit. And then you've got a week to find to some stuff before you play Penn State. Is there, uh, is there anybody that we didn't see much of that you wanted to see more of? Yes, Cam Brown. I, I just, you know, I mentioned it in the Discord. I mentioned it to you off the air. I don't want to be that guy that overreacts to everything. It's just, we saw it, the eyeball test. I know it's practice, okay? Yeah. And I know, but you st he still did things physically on a practice field that translate to me against an FCS team. And he, he was in the game, but I, he didn't get targeted. I would have thought that he would have gotten targeted and got some some catches tonight. I was really looking forward to seeing him and what a freak he is physically. And there was a little bit of a letdown to me that he didn't get targeted at all. Well, I kind of feel that way about most of the wide receivers. Um, as far as guys that – receivers that caught passes, it was Javaris Johnson, Shedrick Jackson, and Tarvarish Dawson Jr. That's it. That's the list. The other people that caught passes were John Samuel Shanker, obviously a tight end, got his touchdown. Good for him. Damari Austin and Tank Bixby. And that was it. Yeah. Those are all the players that caught passes from Auburn. And, and so I wanted to see them kind of flex and say, hey, we, we have some depth at this position now. And like a lot of the guys got the ball 
through a run, like Malcolm Johnson Jr. got a rush, Dawson got a rush, Coy Moore got a rush, which all that's cool. You're finding ways to get them involved, but I want to see more of that. And like Zevion Capers was on the field way earlier than I was expecting, but I don't even think he got a target. He definitely he did, didn't, he didn't. Sense, but I don't think he got a target either. So it's just like, you know, some of this, um, the, the whole wide receiver room, I, I guess, I, I just wanted more out of. And it's not that they didn't execute. They just didn't really get the opportunity to. You make a great point. Here's the frustrating and ironic part. I hope it's not prophetic. This might be one of the best wide receiver rooms Auburn's had in a while, and we may not know it at the end of the year because we may not have a quarterback that can get the ball to him. Last year, say what you want about Bo Nix and some of the things. Remember the Georgia game, 12 drops? There was a lot of drops, and there was a lot of things that we felt like the wide receivers just didn't step up for Bo Nix, and, and he had to make plays on his own. I really feel good about the wide receiver room and the talent and the route running. We just got to find someone to get him the ball because I don't want them to be wasted. I'm there with you, and, and I think that's this coaching staff's fear because I think your attempts per game drop dramatically if you start Robbie Ashford. You good get up point. other places. And maybe you get some pop and some explosiveness, and you, you're going to get a few teams that prepare for you the wrong way. But I just think, and once again, it's only the first week of college football, which is all, of all the teams that that I was able to watch a good bit of. You know, I I think Arkansas at home is extremely beatable. I think Texas A&M at home is extremely beatable. I think Ole Miss isn't anything special. Mm-mm. And it's like the and then Penn State, and it's like if you're able to win those four games, like we can have a really really good season, you know. And yeah, and so like I I don't think Auburn needs to swing for the fences necessarily, and that kind of feels like what starting Robbie Ashford is. But how safe is TJ Finley? I mean, if he's throwing two picks against Mercer, what is he going to do when uh when Auburn hosts Missouri? who Missouri is a much better team than Mercer or LSU or, you know, I mean, then we can just go down the rest of the schedule essentially at that point. So it's concerning. Um, and, I, and I don't know how you sort it out at this point. It may be that Auburn has to take a different path to winning football games than we thought. It may be Robbie Ashford runs for 80 yards a game and throws for 150 a game and Tank Bigsby goes for, a, a, a hundred and 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 Jarquez and the receivers are like can the receivers. Can we win this year? Can we win this year doing that? That's what I'm saying. We might with this defense. We might. I mean, I know it's not 2013 when that formula did work, but again, 2013 and 2014, our defense was giving up 35 points a game. So it's a different SEC, but this might be a different path. I'm not saying that our offense will be stagnant. I'm just saying it may be a different path to get to 450 yards a game, right? And it may not be as balanced as we thought, maybe. I don't know. I think whatever wins, whatever works to to get Auburn the W is what formula they need to go to. Now it's early. Ashford may come out next week and go 20 of 25 for 250 and rush for 60 yards. You know, that may happen. And of course, again, it's against San Jose State, but I think there might be a different path with Ashford to, to getting wins. And if you get 450 yards offense, does it matter how you get there if you get six, if you get touchdowns? I don't know. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and so, yeah, maybe that's part of it. And we'll, um, we'll have to see. But, yeah, I, you know, just kind of spending a second on what else happened out from college football yesterday outside of Auburn. Um, did you watch Bo Nix at all? I did. I watched that. You know, I was I was flipping Thanks. back and forth between another game that I will go unmentioned because I don't want to get ripped and get ridiculed. It's a it's a team I used to pull for, so they were on at the same time. So I was going back and forth, but I watched a, a lot of the Oregon Georgia game, and um, he looked different in the pocket. I mean, he did look a little bit different. It was a little different offensive style and offensive you know scheme. But yeah, I watched that game and. Man, Georgia lot of lost, lost a lot of guys to the NFL, but my goodness, Gosh, they looked good. They looked so good. And they Stetson look Bennett looked good. I, I'm shocked at how Stetson good Stetson. Bennett, yeah, he is scratched and clawed to hold on to that job, and now he's turned into like he's done it for so long, like he's turned into a really good quarterback. Because it's like, how in the world did that? Happen? I know he, that's perseverance. And again, Oregon, we don't know. You know, if they're they were ranked 12th, but they're in the Pac-12. I don't know what's going to happen. But perennially, they've been a good team. I mean, it's not like Georgia opened up against a group of five school, right? They played Oregon, who has been 
in the last five years in some playoff conversations and that kind of thing. They supposedly had their their quarterback in Bo Nix, and uh, my goodness, they looked really, really good. As you know, and and so the Ohio State Notre Dame. There was just a lot of games that were so interesting for me to see, and 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 see if it lived up to the hype. I was glued to Arkansas. And Cincinnati, especially after Georgia jumped up to like 21 nothing or whatever, I was like, okay, let me spend some time on this one. Yeah, I, I was too. They, I, I don't think Arkansas, I said this over the offseason, I don't think Arkansas is what everybody thinks they are. I really don't think they are. I mean, the, they, they've got the, the, the reputation of being these like big, you know, bullies that'll just kind of push you around on both sides of the football. And it's like, well, I know Cincinnati's not your typical, you know, AAC team, but like they were not being pushed around. And so I, I, I just, if that's your, if that's how you're going to win football games, which is how they've overachieved the last two seasons, I just don't think, I don't think they're going to be able to do it consistently. And I also don't think KJ Jefferson's it. I, I, I really don't. It's amazing to me how a team that's 11 and 11 over the last two years is getting so much love. I get momentum and the recency bias where people go, well, you know, they're trending up, but they lost some guys. They lost some dudes last year, right, to the NFL. He's 11 and 11 over the last two years, and people want to make Arkansas out to be a threat in the West. I don't see it yet. I think you have to, to have a year where, you know, you actually challenge for the SEC West title. Are you in it with three games left to go in the season, right? That kind of, that kind of perspective. Yeah, and I, I don't think they will be. Anything else that happened outside of Auburn that you want to mention real quick? No, I mean, it's just, it was a great day. I'm looking forward to tomorrow night with Florida State and LSU. I, I really am looking forward, again, because it's another SEC West team with a new coach. And I guess I'm playing that same type of prove it to me thing like, oh, okay, well, LSU's beatable at, at, at home in Jordan Hare. You know, I want to see how good they are and, and how that game may play out as well. No, I, I think that's one of the worth, uh, Worth, worth some eyeballs for sure. Daryl Daprich, he'll join me every single Sunday morning right here on Locked On. I'm a little morning after edition. Guys, football is back. We are in the thick of the college football season now. We made it. We absolutely made it. And we'll be back tomorrow to talk about it some more. I'm Zach Blackerby. You can follow me on Twitter at Z Blackerby. You can read all my written work at auburndaily.com. And we'll be back tomorrow. Lindsey Crosby will join us right here on Locked On Auburn.